Hi everyone, this is Whitney Benedetto from the Mosaic Women's Ministry, and yes, I am in the middle of Target right now. If you're anything like me, you get really excited about the Christmas things, even if they're super early. No, I'm not skipping Thanksgiving, but I'm just sending you a quick invitation from me. This is for everyone at our church. You're welcome to come to our Advent Wreath Making event on November 28th from 6 to 7.30. It's a family event, so unlike some of our women's ministry events that go with Mosaic, you can bring your whole family to this one. And what you'll do is you'll get a free meal. It's going to be some yummy pasta, so something a little heartier this time. And of course, dessert and treats. And you'll get to make your own Advent Wreath. So you'll be making your own wreath with five candles, three purple, one pink, one white and we'll learn about what those candles mean and why we light them through the advent season and you'll also get a little booklet to use to worship and to learn more as we go through the season of advent right up to the day of christmas so i hope to see you there if you need any details just ask someone at the front and there's sign up table in the lobby see you soon
Good morning, everyone. If you'll stand, we're going to start off with some praise and worship this morning.
can no longer defy wherever your spirit is every darkness dies freedom is here with us burdens will fall like chains beauty will rise from the dust all that's lost will Mercy will pour down like rain. Justice will come for the weak. Lies that we're meant to defame will be crushed by the truth that you speak.
open space for you to come and have your way. I'm open. I'm open. You're faithful to find me right where I am, even in my wandering. You call me friends. Mercy receives me, lifts me to my feet, and I'm caught up in the wonder and mystery of knowing Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to the Lighthouse Church. Why don't you greet whoever's standing next to you this morning? Welcome them to church and say hello. Good morning again and welcome to the Lighthouse Church. It's a joy to see all of you this morning and we're grateful that you're here with us to worship the living God to hopefully grow closer in your walk with Jesus. I love that last song because it's just our hope is that you would come in this morning and just be open to whatever God wants to do in your life, whether it's small things, big things, everything in between. God sees you. He sees what's happening in your life. He's aware of it and he wants to change and transform us that we look a little bit more like Jesus each and every day. And so we just pray and hope that you're open to that. Uh, one of the ways that we want to see that happen here at Lighthouse Church, so it's not just on Sunday mornings, we would love for you to be able to take the next step with us and to get involved in a group. We really believe that it's not just the word you need, but you need a community to grow with and to have people around you that are going to walk through life together. And so some ways you can do that, uh, we have them happening every week, mo uh, Monday night, the men and women's meet, there's a women's group on Tuesday and on Wednesday, 
Uh, we have our bridge on Wednesday nights for anyone from age zero all the way up. And so we want to just make sure that you're able to take that next step and have the opportunity to do that because we don't want to be strangers. We want to make sure that we were able to, to walk alongside you. Uh, just a couple quick announcements I have for this morning, and then we'll move on. Uh, if you have kids, uh, obviously this week we said send them up to the chapel uh, when you come in. It'll be the same thing next week. You'll send them right upstairs because they are prepping for December 5th, which will be a Youth and Kids Sunday. And so we're looking forward to that. And they're prepping some songs and stuff that they're going to do. So next Sunday as well, you can shoot them on upstairs. Uh, hopefully you saw when you came in the lobby, we have a number of things happening during this Christmas time. Uh, one of them uh, is an Advent wreath making night. The very first uh, night of the Advent season starts. It's the last Sunday in November, November the 28th. And so here at the church, you can bring your family. And uh, we have live actual, well, I guess they're not live because you chop them off. But they're greens. They're real. They're not artificial. We'll go with that. Uh, and then you can make your own Advent wreath and, and kick off the Advent season together. We'd love for you uh, uh, to join us like that. We have a number of other Christmas mission things that we're going to be doing, but the one that is in the lobby right now is Operation Christmas Child with the shoeboxes. You can still grab a shoebox this week, but they all got to be in by next week, okay? So if you have one, if you've been procrastinating, right, not that any of us would do that, make sure you get it back by next week, and uh, we'll make sure that we can take care of that. But uh, that's all I have for this morning, other than uh, the only other one that just came to my mind is there's this thing called a peak assessment, which is something we've been doing as a, a church. We've been invited to do it by our district just to help uh, us as a church see how we can best move forward. Uh, it's a survey that we'd love for you to fill out. So there's a QR code that you can scan. We can send you a link to your email, whatever it is. We would love for you to get that in. And I think those are due this week too as well. So uh, we'd love for you, if you haven't done that yet, uh, to take the time to do it. Uh, but I'm going to pray and we're going to keep moving with our service during this next song. We're going to take our offering. We have offering baskets up here and here and a couple in the back. If you're still new to Lighthouse Church, we don't want your money. Keep it in your pocket. Uh, we just love for you to just enjoy the service and receive the gift that God has for you, uh, which is someone named Jesus. But let me pray this morning. God, thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, we're so grateful and thankful that you're that constant, faithful presence, Lord, that no matter what we uh, have, how we've performed during the week, God, you're still faithful to love us, to care for us, Lord. You're always there, ready and willing for us uh, to, to come back home. So Lord, I'm praying, I'm praying for the one that needs to come back home this morning, that needs to know that the arms of Jesus are still wide open for them. God, that you have a seat at the table for each and every one of us. Lord, we continue to pray for physical healing to those that came in, bearing burdens on their bodies, God, whether it's mentally, physically, spiritually, all those things, we look to you to be our healer this morning, God. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, move in this place through your word, through Pastor Gary's message. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray.
died is not of you and is of me. I want more of you and less of me. So would you turn with me uh, to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3. Lord, those are uh, just powerful uh, truths about um, me being less and you being more. So, Lord, I pray that you would empty us today of our fears, of the feelings that limit, hinder. I thank you for creating us with emotion. I thank you for creating us in your image. I thank you for creating us with the intellect, emotion, and will. And, Lord, I believe some of that drive, at least for me, um, boxes you in and drives me towards self towards control out of fear and the unknown and a lack of belief. And Lord, we sing those words about being open to whatever you say. <laughs> That's a lofty prayer, Lord, um, to be willing to be a people individually and as a church to move in any direction you want us to go. Lord, I thank you for allowing us to wake up this morning. It's a big deal in a country of freedom to gather together without fear of persecution. I don't know why people are in this room, but you do. There are some that are here that are completely here in victory today, that are here in joy, uh, in a peace that transcends all understanding. But I also know there's people in this room um, that were either dragged here or people in this room that don't have a relationship with you. My guess is there are marriages that are on the brink and relationships that need to be reconciled, and I ask for healing. Lord, I ask for you, and only you have the ability to change a heart. There's no words that I have, no power that I have as a human to even change myself, let alone another human being. So I'm asking for your Holy Spirit to stir. I'm asking for your word to go forth. Lord, none of this would be possible without Jesus. Lord, the name of Jesus changes everything. And so, Lord, I pray today, um, if there's anybody in this room that doesn't know you or needs to return to you, that you would call and we'd repent, that you would enable us to come to you in the name of Jesus. And for those of us that believe, that we would stand firm on that belief that you are who you say you are, and you've got a mission and a plan to change us from the inside out while we're your hands and feet, that you'd be glorified. In Jesus' name. Acts chapter 3. So over the past few months, I've had the uh, privilege, I guess you could say, uh, to facilitate four funerals. Memorial services, celebration of life services, uh, whatever you want to call them. And when I'm asked to do a funeral service, I consider it a very intimidating ask. I feel it's a very intimidating sort of place to be um, when a group of people uh, knowingly come together um, as they mourn, as they grieve, as they celebrate, and as they remember the life of a human being that has left this earth forever. It's an intimidating sort of place to be because I know that when you bring people together, and for the four that I've facilitated, uh, that uh, a portion of those people coming together to mourn and grieve and celebrate are people that don't have a relationship with the living God. And I know that some do have a relationship with the living God. And I know that when people come to a place and a space to grieve and mourn and remember, they come with a whole host of emotions, sadness, anger, confusion, uncertainty. And so it's an intimidating place to be to create a space where they can celebrate and remember, but also my role is to communicate the good news of Jesus. 
My role is to send a message of hope within about 10 minutes that there is hope. And of the four funerals that I have uh, facilitated, three of those funerals, the deaths around those deaths were difficult circumstances. And so of the four, I started every four the same way, with scripture. I quoted Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. The Lord is good. He is a refuge in times of trouble, and he cares for those who trust in him. But after I use that verse, I say this. I understand that there are people sitting or standing graveside before me who are having a difficult time in this moment reconciling that God is good. Within the midst of what is circling around them. But what I also say is I believe that God's word is true and that those words are truth. That God is good even in the midst of things when they aren't good. God is still good. I believe he is a refuge, a place of safety and protection, even if you're living in fear. And I believe that he is the God that cares for those completely who trust in him. And so what I ask people to do, knowing that there are unbelievers in the midst, I say, but in the midst of what you're thinking and what you're feeling and what you're experiencing, I'm asking you to do one thing. I'm asking you to allow God to move in the midst because he is who he says he is. What I'm asking you to do today is several things, but I'm going to begin with this. I don't know why you're in this building today. You come here for a wide variety of reasons. Some may have been dragged here. With the, some are coming in victory. Some are coming to praise the living God. Some are here because it's what they do, and some are here because they don't know why. And with those reasons, those comes expectations. For those who may have been dragged here being like, how long is he going to speak for? How long is this service going to go on? And that's understandable. It's an expectation based on why you're here. Some have a certain level of expectations of what they expect to experience with music, with a message, how the chairs are set up, what the lighting's supposed to be about. What I'm asking you to do in the next few minutes it doesn't matter why you're here. It doesn't matter really what your expectations are. But what I'm asking you to do in the next few minutes is to allow the Holy Spirit to stir in a way that will challenge your understanding of what the church is supposed to look like. Not based on what you grew up with, not based on what you even hope it to be, but are you willing to allow the Holy Spirit to move in a way that reshapes and defines the way the church should look like. Why do I ask you to do that? Because I believe God has more for us as individuals and as a church. When I say that God has more for us, it doesn't minimize what God has done or is doing. But in the midst of every human being, God has more for you. But that more comes only when we allow the Holy Spirit to do his work. The core value today is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. When you look at the book of Acts, and which we're going to do in a very few minutes, is look at stories through the book of Acts, you see that the New Testament church, the book of Acts, is the first 30 years of the New Testament church. And if you read Acts, which I would encourage you to go home and read, it is almost unbelievable. It's that amazing. But the shape and definition of the church was completely Holy Spirit driven. It was not of human origin. When you think about transition and this church in a place of transition, I'm sorry, but this transition that we're going through is nothing compared to what the transition the disciples went through. Think about the disciples. Can you imagine God in flesh on earth? The Bible says that when Jesus, Isaiah 53, that Jesus, was, when he was on this earth, we have no idea what he looked like. Our pictures, I don't think, are anything close to what he looked like because the Bible indicates there was no human feature that would have attracted us to him. That according to the world's standards, he was unattractive. But yet we have these pictures of a Caucasian-looking man with blonde flowing 
hair, who grew up in a Middle Eastern area. <laughs> but imagine a man that was God in flesh. God sent that walked the earth. And as he walked, he pointed to people and said, come follow me. And for a couple years, these men and women from afar, so to speak, followed him and lived with him. And you know if you've read the Gospels, that was not an easy road for those disciples. As they tried to understand who Jesus was and what he was doing, why he was doing it, where he was going, as they follow him, and he says, join in on this mission that I'm on. Not just to create an earthly kingdom, but I am the kingdom. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And follow me and as they're going down this road, he starts to predict his death. And then they watch him being nailed to a cross, beaten and tortured, and then put in a tomb and then wondering, what's next? Then he raises from the dead and appears to them again and calls them to a mission to go make disciples. And we know that they had a difficult time following him in flesh. But now he says... I have a mission for you, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm sending my Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God. And what I need you to do is recognize and respond to Him. That's a transition. <laughs> to go from following God in flesh to God the Holy Spirit. And they did. And God moved in a way that was unmistakably Him. My question to us today is, do you believe that's relevant for us today? Because I believe with all my heart it is. And the power and presence of God moved in ways that were almost, almost unbelievable. And I believe God has more for us, but it starts with me and allowing the Holy Spirit. We sang a, we sang a song, I'm open. Are you really open to do whatever he asks you to do? And it begins in Acts, chapter 3, verse 1. Acts 3, verse 1. It says, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. At three in the afternoon, now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. And you disowned him before Pilate, though he decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Do you believe that that level of healing is available to us today? When we read God's word, there are a couple questions you need to ask yourself when we're reading it. Is, is this prescriptive 
or descriptive? Is this prescribing the way it's supposed to be, or is this simply describing what was going on in this culture? I believe that Acts is prescriptive and descriptive, that he is prescribing the way it's supposed to be and describing what actually was happening in those moments of time. I would define a miracle as an event or experience that happens that defies the laws of human nature and science that when people look around and see that it could be none other than the divine being. When we look at these stories, I'm asking you to look at not just what happened, but how it happened and where it happened. When you look at this story, this was a man who was crippled from birth. We know that walking is a learned skill. You've never seen a baby pop out of the womb, land on his feet and start walking. You know that when you have little ones, it's a process that starts from crawling to learning how to stand and learning how to walk. This is a man who probably, I'm assuming, because he was crippled from birth, never walked. That's a miracle in and of itself, that when he gained his strength, can you imagine the atrophy in this man's body, who never walked, who in a moment of time, God strengthened his legs and gave him not just the ability to walk, but to jump. That's amazing. That's what happened. How did it happen? It happened in the name of Jesus of Nazareth alone. They said here to the people who were looking around in amazement and all like, whoa, this is not because of who we are. This is about who he is. That it came in the name and, there's another word there, faith, and who Jesus is. And where did it happen to me is equally important as everything else. That it happened on the streets before they got into the temple. Do you believe that miracles like this, God still wants to put himself on display in this way? And for those of you, and there are those that believe that miracles like this are only for this period of time, I've got two questions if you think that's true. Number one, what do you do with salvation? Salvation is a miracle of God. Salvation. That an understanding begins with that you and I were created in the image of the living God. Can you imagine? It's true that you were created in the image of the living God. And he created you with purpose. And that purpose is to have an intimate relation. That you might walk. Walk with the creator. Go outside and look at the beauty that is. And the God that designed it, ordained it, put it in place, controls it. He wants to walk with you. That is why you breathe. That he might glorify himself as you and I walk with him. But when you were born into this earth, you were born enslaved into sin. You aren't just sinners. We were born enslaved, wrapped up into sin. In a slavery that you and I had an inability to rip ourselves from. That slavery created a chasm that is not crossable by man. And so God, as an act of love, sent Jesus. His life, his death, his resurrection, his blood... His life, the sacrifice, filled in the chasm. So that if man confesses with his mouth and believes in his heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. But the Bible indicates, and I believe that it's true, that God chose you, you didn't choose him. And that's a miracle, my friends. That God chose you and provided a way. And when God called on you and you said yes, the Holy Spirit came in and desires to empower you, and change you, and fill you, and comfort you. That's a miracle. So if you don't believe in miracles today, what do you do with salvation? How about this? If you don't believe in miracles today, what do you do with prayer? The living God, the God of the universe, hears you is a miracle. 
that he answers you. The living God in the midst of all that's going on today hears you with a level of intimacy and answers. In 2018 of May, in May of 2018, I got a text. I was at Youth Advocate Programs, and I got a text from Pastor Rudy. And he asked me if I wanted to come down to the Lighthouse Church. Now, I mean, it was like not even a sentence. And so that, to some of you, would be like, well, that's bizarre, but it's not, because two years prior to that, in 2016, I got a Facebook message from Pastor Rudy saying, are you interested in coming down here uh, to be one of the pastors at the Lighthouse Church? And uh, within a short amount of time after that Facebook message, uh, he said that the timing wasn't right for that. 20 years prior to that, or I don't remember the exact time, but it was a long time ago when Pastor Rudy first came down here, uh, he asked me to join him as his youth pastor, and I declined because I was walking down a road that was destructive and a road of sin that has a still a ripple effect on my children. So I knew along this journey, backtracking, that if God used Pastor Rudy to call me down here, that I was going to say yes. And so in May of 2018, when I got a text from Pastor Rudy about coming down here, um, I said, we're open for discussion. And... Uh, we set up a time in June for me to come down here, uh, myself and Debbie and Greg and Emily to come down and sort of interact with some people from the Lighthouse Church and figure out if this is the right timing or not. But what had to happen before we came down here was that we had to tell our kids why we were coming down here. And so my son, Greg, uh, who was in seventh grade at the time, finishing his seventh grade year in school, and my daughter was finishing her sophomore uh, year in school, and so they would be entering into eighth grade uh, and, their, and her junior year in high school, and so I remember uh, one day after church, we came home, and Debbie and I sat in the living room with our kids, and uh, we said to them, um, it's possible um, that in September, uh, you guys will be starting school in a new location, and so these kids were deeply rooted into the community, into the school, had amazing friends, and we didn't know what sort of reaction or response we were going to get. And their response was profound. There was no yelling, there was no screaming, but they just got up and left the room. And so I'm assuming, and I know, that they had an inability to even process what I was telling them. This is the life that they knew and that they really enjoyed. And I'm telling them that I might be uprooting them. And my son, uh, both of my kids are very verbal, right? They're very, we've created an atmosphere of communication and talk and that sort of thing. And so my son's response was to not speak for days. Walked around the house, refused to speak. There were some times he would walk around the house. It's kind of funny when you look at it now, not when you're walking through it, where he would walk around the house with a covering over his face because he just really... And I knew at that point that I had, there was nothing I was going to be able to say to make this better. So as I would normally do, I went to the living God and said, God, you got to do something. Because I have no words. There's nothing I'm going to change to help his heart. I knew that if they came down here, <clears throat> I knew it was going to be one of these mornings. If they came down here and they were bitter against God, what is that going to do? And so I said, God, you got to do what I can't do. And I just begged them to do something. I don't know, within a week, I was working from home one day and Greg was coming home from school. And when I met him at the door, his countenance, his face, he felt a little different. And so I said, what's, what's going on? Like, why? He looked different. And he said that he was waiting. Uh, he stayed after school for something. And he was waiting for the bus to take him home. And he ran into his baseball coach. And his baseball coach uh, said, hey, you know, looking forward to you sort of playing next year on the team and that sort of thing. And Greg said, I'm not going to. He said, I may not be playing baseball next year because I may not be here. And so his baseball coach 
sort of sat him down and had a conversation how his coach actually moved several times through high school while playing baseball and that it all worked out. He basically said that Greg, it's gonna be fine. And so I believe that that was God moving in the heart of an unbeliever to accomplish his will. You see, I believe it's a miracle so much so that I emailed within minutes, I went on my computer and emailed the coach. He must have thought I was a lunatic. Said, you have no idea what your words did because your words started to redirect a heart. And I believe that's a miracle. So if you don't think miracles happen today, why pray? I believe the power of the living God is alive and well. I believe he wants to heal the heart. I believe he wants to heal us completely. Now, I know that some of us in this room will say immediately, then why does, I can't tell you why he does in a time, but I believe that he does, and I pray that he does. Do you believe that that healing is available today? And I do believe it is, and it's completely Holy Spirit dependent that we be willing, because what the, what the disciples were willing to do is allow the Holy Spirit to define and direct the church. It was completely Holy Spirit driven. And when I say God has more, God has more power and presence that's available to us. Not just through healing power, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, but I also believe in relationships. If you go to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All, think of the words that are used here. All of the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If you jump over to 4, chapter 4 of Acts, verse 32, all the believers were one. Again, think of the words, all, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had with great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was given upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands of houses sold them, brought the money from, from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Can you imagine? Here's my question. Have you ever been in a community like that? And why is it so rare? If that's prescriptive and descriptive. And I, I can't hear any more people say, well, those are different. I would rather live in the times that we are than those times. <laughs> we have luxuries. They didn't. What happened? How did it happen? Where did it happen? These were people that were living in unity. That they all had everything in common moving in the same direction, encouraging one another, forgiving one another, building one another up. There was community, deep community where they were loving, loving one another. Not just in word, but considered their, their possessions not their own. We live in a meism, it's mine! That's why one of the core values is it's all God's. Where did this happen? Yes, they spent time in the temple courts, but it also says that they spent time where? In their homes. And part of this sort of allowing the Holy Spirit to define and shape the direction of the church is this idea that the church doesn't only happen in this building. That when you read the stories of Acts, what happened happened outside a building. And if we are reliant to just watch the Holy Spirit move here, which he will do, I get it, I'm not limiting, but I believe we're falling short on what he wants us to experience. 
that we are supposed to be building community with one another. And yes, it's important to have Bible studies in the buildings, men's groups, women's groups, bridge, we have cure, we have stuff going on, and there's value to it, and it's part of the discipling process. But it's not the end all, and it shouldn't end there. That should drive us to spending time with one another in our homes to go deeper, to walk together with one another so we can care for one another. There are people in our midst that at certain points of their life need a significant amount of care. And it will be very difficult to build the level of relationships where we can care for one another, with one another, in the day-to-day and living in a sinful, broken world if we limit our relational activity to just what's going on in the building. But I believe we limit it because relationships are messy. And it's easier and cleaner if we walk in, love your brother, pray for your brother, go out and do our own thing. It happened here, and I don't think this is just, wow, that was amazing. This is what it's supposed to look like. But it can only happen if it's Holy Spirit driven. I have an inability to live like this. Because I battle my, the flesh of self. I'm selfish and self-driven. I'm self-seeking. That's the flesh. But the Spirit wants to come in and empower me. To rid me, to empty me of that. To allow him to love those around me, even those that oppose me. My question to you is, over the last 30 days, how many people have you had in your home? Those that believe and those that don't believe. Quickly, Acts chapter 9. Great power came and something happened. Long story short, there's a guy named Cornelius. And Cornelius, in a vision, saw an angel. And the angel said, there's a guy named Peter. I want you to go send some men to go get Peter. He's got a message to tell you. As Peter is seeing a vision, the Holy Spirit says to him, there's a guy who's sending some men to go come get you. Go with him. And so in Cornelius' house, as they're anticipating Peter coming, is a large gathering of people, relatives and close friends. Now, it would be illegal for Peter to be in the house of Cornelius because of their backgrounds. And in 10, verse 34, then Peter began to speak. As Peter arrives, as all this is fleshed out, then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, Whom is Lord of all? You know what's happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses to everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day that and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by, the, by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter, Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. This is extraordinary because now we see that salvation is available to all. And you and I should be grateful that God's plan is huge. Do lost people matter to you? Do the people that God has put in your web of influence, those in your home, those in your families, 
those in your neighborhoods, I stand before you believing, based on my experience and observation in God's word, that God gave us a house to live, not just because it's a cool house to live in, but he strategically places us in spots where he wants us to be a light in a dark world. And that's why I pray for my neighbors by name. To give me an opportunity, believing that when somebody takes their last breath, and they don't have a relationship with the living God through Jesus, they will spend eternity away from him. In eternal damnation. Do lost people matter to you? You don't have to be an evangelist to evangelize. That's why I'm not a huge fan of spiritual testing. Spiritual gift. I get it why people do it. But at times I've heard people say to me, Gary, well I didn't test as an evangelist, so I don't have to really be involved in that. God gives you a gift, I believe, at times in our area of weakness. Because a gift is a supernatural manifestation of the Spirit to accomplish His good and to edify the body. And so God may give you a gift in a moment of time to be an evangelist, whether you think it, want it, or know it. God called Peter to go to Cornelius' house. An unlikely matching. God will call you to minister to whomever he wants you to minister to. It's not your call. It's his call. We are used to controlling things. That's why I asked you to allow the Spirit to move. It's what happened, how it happened, and where it happened. That God called an unlikely man to go to a home to share the good news where people received it, and it happened where? In a home. I'm not discounting the stuff we do here, but what I'm saying is the Holy Spirit moves outside this building where the lost are. Are we willing to go wherever God calls us to go? And finally, I know it's getting late, Acts chapter te- uh, 5. The growth in this church, in his church, you've seen and will see I think it's about a dozen times where you would see words that God increased their numbers significantly. They weren't holding outreach events. They were following the Spirit's leading. But the church was undergoing a great amount of persecution. The church was exploding. People were being flogged and imprisoned and killed because they were following Jesus. But there was also a threat that came from the inside real quick. Uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge. He kept back part of the money for himself. He brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said. This is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down on his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church, and all heard about these events. I'd say there's a little bit of an edge to this story, and I'm not going to unpack it. It's loaded with stuff. But here are a group of people who are pretend, these two people were pretending to be somebody they weren't. I'm not a fan of people using the word hypocrite. I'm not a fan of people calling themselves hypocrites or calling people in the church hypocrites. Jesus used the word hypocrites for only one group of people, and that was the Pharisees. Hypocrites are people that pretend you and I are sinners saved by grace. Fellow strugglers, what well, you are going to make mistakes. I will disappoint you. I will make bad decisions. I will sin because I am a human being, flesh battling spirit. That does not define somebody as a hypocrite. It's a saint saved by grace. These people were pretending to be someone they weren't. And the attack came from where? Satan. Do you believe that we are involved in a war? That Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants to do it, what? From the inside. 
Are you aware? And I know this fa- the battle is not against flesh and blood. And I also note in Ephesians, he says, I have given you the full armor of God. So suit up. This road that is Holy Spirit driven involves battles. And so if you are here just to be comfortable, the Big C Church is probably not the place for you. Because if the Big C Church is on the road that is Holy Spirit empowered, there are going to be battles that need to be waged, that need the full armor of God. And so I end how I began, with Nahum. Do you know what Nahum is about? Do you know the story Jonah and the whale? I'm fascinated that Jonah and the whale is a kid's story. When my kids were little, there's this animated Christian series, which not everybody's a fan of because it's vegetables telling Bible stories, but my kids used to watch Veggie Tales, and one of those is Jonah and the Whale. And I'm fascinated, knowing what Jonah and the Whale is about, even though it's a story of second chances, I'm fascinated that a story when a man who ran in disobedience was swallowed by a whale is interesting to kids. I think it would be terrifying to know that if I ran from God, I'd be swallowed. Now, yes, he was vomited up. And yes, he was obedient to God, and God, but God sent him to a group of people, which is actually another illustration that God chooses to call you to go to whoever he wants you to call. Jonah didn't want to go to the Ninevites, but it wasn't Jonah's choice. Jonah ends up going, long story short, says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, and they repent, and he's agitated about it. 150 years later, that place was back where they started. And so judgment was coming their way. Nahum is a prophet who is coming to tell the Ninevites, judgment's coming, and in the midst of the judgment, because if you read Nahum 1 verse 8, it says, the one says, the Lord is good, he is a refuge in times of trouble, and he cares for those who trust in him, but with an overwhelming flood, I am going to destroy Nineveh. Your time is up. Why? Because their repentance was shallow. What I'm asking us today is to be people who are not comfortable wallowing in the shallow waters. Is to not be people who are comfortable allowing the Holy Spirit to do a little bit of work, but not a lot of work. Is to allow ourselves to be in a position where we allow the Spirit to move us in a direction that makes us uncomfortable, that puts us in a position where God has to show up. Because that's what happened to these people. And he put himself on display in ways that are unmistakably him. And so my encouragement to us today, I end the same way every week, is one moment at a time. I'm not asking you to be better. I'm asking you to lean in to the power of the living God. Because he has promised to change hearts, to heal relationships, to heal bodies, to reconcile relationships to heal marriages, to reunite with families. Why? Not because we've earned or deserve it. Because he wants to put himself on display. The Bible says that when he speaks, he acts, and when he promises, he fulfills. Praise God. Lord, I pray that my conjecture or words that aren't related to truth would fall to the ground. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in me first. Lord, there is so much I'm reluctant to surrender to. But I thank you for your grace and your mercy and compassion along the way. (laughs) You are unbelievably gracious and compassionate. And Lord, I pray that we would be people who don't settle. Lord, that we are people who desire more of you. The change. Lord, more of you that provides a peace that transcends all understanding. An inexpressible, glorious joy. Lord, that we take one step at a time to watch you do what you do. That you be glorified. In Jesus' name. I need you to soften my heart and break me Open my eyes to see that.
God, you shape in my life. And all I am, I surrender. Give me faith to trust what you say. That you're good in your love is great. I'm broken inside. I give you my life. I'm in my heart and break me apart I need you to pierce through the dark and cleanse every part of me and all I am I serve What you say that you're good, your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life. Cause I may be. may fail but my God you never will cause I may be weak but your spirit strong in me my flesh may fail but my God you never will give me faith to trust what you say that you're good and your love is great I'm broken inside I give you my life Sing that one more time, I may be weak Cause I may be weak But your spirit's strong in me my flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. Lord, our hearts will fail. Our flesh will cause us to fail, God, but you will never fail. So, Lord, just give us opportunities this week to lean into you. Holy Spirit, open our eyes to where you're moving. Don't let us miss it. Amen. There are opportunities right now if you want to come and pray up here. So don't rush out of here if you need something to pray for.